Resourceful Designer, episode 285, NDAs for Designers, with Gordon Firemark. Welcome to the Resourceful Designer podcast, offering solutions to streamline your graphic and web design business so you can get back to designing. And now, your host, he coached both his kids' soccer teams, Mark Dicko. Yep, for both the indoor soccer league during the winter and the outdoor league during the summer. I even got certified as a youth soccer coach, although I did have to stop coaching my daughter when she joined the Provincial Competitive League. But overall, it was a great way to spend quality time with my kids. Anyway, in this episode, I'm joined by attorney Gordon Firemark to discuss non-disclosure agreements, what they are, how and why you should use them, and when to and not to sign them. I think you'll enjoy this episode. But before I get to that, I just want to remind you about the Resourceful Designer community. Everyone who's a member keeps talking about the benefits they get from being in the community, how they can bounce ideas off people, people who understand where they're coming from and not have to worry about people stealing or poaching their work and all that, how they can trust the opinions of these people that they've gotten to know. And how it's just a great place to hang out when you want to talk to somebody. If you're feeling isolated at home and you just need somebody to connect with, the community is a great place for that. Especially considering that everyone in there understands what you're going through. And when it comes to actually growing your design business, there's no better place to turn for advice. With all the members combined, there's decades and decades of experience to draw from. So if you're looking for a community of like-minded people who just want to improve and grow their design business just like you do, then why don't you consider joining? Visit resourcefuldesigner.com slash community today. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, I have the privilege of talking NDAs with attorney Gordon Firemark. Now, NDAs just so happens to be one of the most popular search terms or keywords used to discover the Resourceful Designer website, and looking through my back catalog of podcast episodes, the two that I've previously done talking about NDAs are some of the most popular episodes and most downloaded episodes of my back catalog. Now, of course, in both of those episodes, I just shared my personal experience with NDAs. But I thought you might enjoy actually hearing from a lawyer's perspective. And that's why I reached out to Gordon Firemark. Now, Gordon is a podcast friend of mine. I've met him at several podcast conferences. He's kind of in my group of people that hang out when we go to these things. Well, Gordon practices entertainment law in California, USA, where he helps artists, writers, producers, directors, and all that achieve their dreams in the fields of theater, film, television, and other new medias. Now, you may be wondering, well, what does an entertainment lawyer have to do with graphic design? Well, think of it this way. Every theater production, every film or movie, television show, and other forms of new media, such as YouTube or podcasting or even social media influencers, at some point, they may require the expertise of a designer just like you. And many times, those designers are brought into the mix long before the entertainment product is ready to go public. And for that reason, the person hiring said designer wants to protect their intellectual property. And that's where non-disclosure agreements come into play, to help protect their IP by setting the boundaries of what the designer can or cannot say about the projects they're working on. But you don't want to hear about this from me, so let's get straight to the interview. Welcome to Resourceful Designer, Gordon. Thanks for having me, Mark. It's great to be here. Now, as I explained to my listeners, NDAs is a very popular search term used to find resourceful designers. So I thought I'd get somebody like you uh, in the law field to discuss NDAs. So let's get right to it. And from a legal point of view, what is an NDA? Well, let's get off right off the bat and, and say that, you know, NDA stands for non-disclosure agreement. Another term that is used sort of synonymously is confidentiality agreement. The The real term of the one that we in the legal profession seem to throw around is confidential non-disclosure agreement. Really what it is is a promise to treat certain information as 
confidential and not to share it with anybody except under the circumstances provided in the agreement. So that's that. The real trick, of course, is defining what is that confidential information that's covered by this agreement. So an NDA would be in addition to your normal contract that you would sign with your client. It can be done either way. You know, you can include the confidentiality language inside your your services agreement or the uh, you know whatever em- employment engagement agreement that you're you're working under, or you can treat it as separate. Uh, a lot of companies like to do it separately because it gives them the, I guess, the flexibility to have a more verbose detailed confidentiality agreement rather than just having to squeeze it into a paragraph or two inside a larger contract. Okay. That makes sense. So as a designer, whether they're a graphic designer or a web designer, which most of my listeners fall into one, if not both those categories, what would be the type of situation where we might be asked to sign an NDA for a client? If you have a a project that you're developing for a, a product or a service or a business that hasn't yet launched, that isn't out in the marketplace yet. Uh, It may be uh, a marketing decision, a strategic decision. There may be legal reasons like federal securities laws or uh, some other restrictions that are governing this because the licenses haven't gotten into place or something like that. So the company may not want any information about this new venture, this new thing out there for the public until it's ready to manage the dissemination of that information. So they're going to be very concerned that you aren't telling the world, hey, there's this great new movie coming out. (laughs) You know, uh, that's actually one of the common examples is um, Marvel has been using non-disclosure agreements with all of its cast and crew and everybody involved. If you're designing the poster for the next Iron Man movie and they haven't announced who's going to be in it or what the plot of the story is or whatever, they want to make sure that that's going to be under their control when they release that information so that they can maximize the chances of getting people to come to the theater and see the movie. So that's the kind of example. Well, that makes sense. Uh, I know uh, from my past history, I've had to deal with NDAs uh, a couple of times. Uh, One was somebody had filed a patent and they were waiting for the patent to come through while we were designing packaging and everything. And we had to sign an NDA because he was afraid that his innovative uh, new invention that he had come up with. Uh, he didn't want somebody else to steal the idea. So That's right, exactly. The, the patent protection has to be, I should say, the patent registration has to happen before any publication of the, the product occurs. Otherwise, it loses its patent protection. Good. So when you're signing an NDA, say myself, I, I am a one-man team here, mm-hmm. but sometimes I do use contractors to do certain parts of my jobs. If I sign an NDA with a client, do the people that I contract to fall under that NDA? Well, the client is going to expect that they will and that you will take the appropriate steps to make sure that that happens. But merely because you've signed an NDA with your client, that doesn't mean that your subcontractors necessarily are aware of the fact that there's confidentiality required. So it really is incumbent on you to get your subs to sign those non-disclosure agreements as well to make sure that you're protecting that information all the way down the line. You Merely by sharing it with a subcontractor who's not under a confidentiality obligation to you, you're now violating that confidentiality obligation to your client. So would that mean getting the subcontractor to sign the original NDA or would I have to issue a separate NDA to my contractor uh, as the employer for them? Well, there's no privity of contract between your subcontractor and the end result client. So yeah, you need to have a separate contract, a separate NDA with your subs. Now, it might be as simple as saying, I have read and, and acknowledged the terms of the non-disclosure agreement you've signed with so-and-so, and I agree to keep it all the same information confidential. But I would just say, use a separate NDA with your clients, with your subs, I mean. Good. Now, when it comes to like just like any contract, an NDA is in effect uh, a contract, as you said. Mm-hmm. What would you say are the standard clauses in an NDA that we should be looking for? Well, one clause that I think should be standard that that actually sometimes doesn't find its way is a an explanation of when the confidentiality obligation ends. It's one thing to say, I promise to keep it confidential. And then the company releases their product or service or movie or whatever it is, and you're still not allowed to talk about it. Well, once the information is out there in the public and no longer secret, then you should also have the right to you know, speak about it 
to a certain extent. Now, you may not be able to discuss the specific terms of what you did or, or those kinds of things. And there may be reasons why a company doesn't want to acknowledge that someone worked on this project uh, for them that they, you know, if you subcontract to, uh, Steven Spielberg, <laughs> they may not, you may not want the world to know that he did some of the work for you. But as far as the, uh, yeah, the, the confidentiality should expire at some point. Oftentimes it's once it's been made public by the client or by third parties, not under a confidentiality obligation, or if it's already available in the public uh, sphere, uh, you, you shouldn't be bound by confidentiality. Where this becomes an issue for designers, I suspect, is with relation to you want to put up your portfolio of work and show people the work you've done. So you want to make sure that your NDA includes a provision that gives you the right to do that. Because also, if you transfer copyright ownership in the material you create, you're infringing the copyright if you post it on your website or in your portfolio. So you want to make sure that there's a, uh, a license back to use it for your promotional and marketing purposes usually after a window of time or once the confidentiality has expired. Yeah. I had to sign a, an NDA once with Pepsi mm -hmm. saying, and after the NDA, it stated that once a certain time, like it said after it was a two year period, um, they didn't have a date. It was after two years, I was allowed to say that I had worked with Pepsi, but I'm still not allowed to say what I did for them. Right. The specifics of the, of the confidential information, confidential information, can often be more you know broader than just who is the client and so yeah you want to you know do the best you can to make sure that it's protective of both sides you know if you were working for coca-cola and for some reason had to or pepsi or, or you had and you had to have access to the recipe for original coca-cola <laughs> they don't ever want that information out there <laughs> but the fact that you were given access to it could be very valuable to you for promotional purposes mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as long as you know you're not going to reveal the the actual ingredients or the, the kernels, 11 herbs and spices, another example of yeah, a trade exactly. secret that only value comes from its secrecy. So what exactly, when you, when you get an NDA from a, a client that wants you to sign it, what sort of things should you look out for other than time frame and that? Is there any specific clauses or anything that clients might try to slip in that we should be weary of? You know, it, it's sort of all over the map. I mean, obviously <laughs> read the thing really carefully. And be sure that you understand everything that's operating in there. If there's something you don't understand, get with a lawyer, get with someone who does get these things and, and can explain it and, and put it into context. The kinds of things that we see in NDAs that tend to bite people are an overbroad scope of, of what's covered or how long things are covered. And uh, another thing called a liquidated damages clause. That's the, the clause that says, if you breach this, you'll owe us a million dollars or something like that. While there's some question about the legality and enforceability of those kinds of clauses, generally they are enforceable, but they have to be reasonably connected to the, you know, the likelihood of the actual damages suffered and things like that. But you see that being used as a real disincentive to, to breach, you know, which is appropriate, but at the same time, people should not be terrified by the prospect that they could lose everything just because they, you know, had a slip of the tongue or something like that. And so. You got to be careful about that. And if something seems unreasonable, you know, X through it and say, hey, I, I can't sign that. That's just too extreme. You know, it may be worth letting the job go or maybe you have to compromise and just accept that they're bullying you. <laughs> so just like any other contract, an NDA is negotiable. And uh, Absolutely. yeah, good. So when it comes to an NDA, is there any point during the, the time period that the NDA covers where it's OK for you to actually break the NDA? You know, that's a, a really great question, Mark. The, the truth is, when you're under an NDA, most of the time it's, it's really restricting any disclosure of the information whatsoever. Now, there are going to be circumstances where uh, a government action, a police investigation or a court case or something like that, you're going to be compelled to testify and provide the information. And a proper NDA should include a carve out to specifically make it okay if you are compelled by legal, by legal process. And, and if you're the party that's trying to protect your information, you want to build into that agreement some mechanism for a, if you get a subpoena for this information, you come and tell us so we can go to court and object and, and try to stop it before you disclose the information. But if the court ultimately orders you to provide the information, you will not be deemed to be in breach of this agreement. And what happens if that clause that you've mentioned is not in the agreement? I think that in, in, 
most courts would look at that and say, well, but there was a subpoena. He, you know, okay. <laughs> you're going to say he should go to jail instead of re revealing this information. That's unreasonable. We're not going to enforce it. But better to have the language in there and, and, you know, protect everybody, give them that opportunity to go seek a protective order and those kinds of things. Because once information is made public in court, it's a matter of public record. So you do want to, you know, try to help out your, your client when you can. Okay. And what about in a, a case where uh, like non-disclosure means you shouldn't divulge any of this information, right? but sometimes a client might give you something physical, like maybe it's a, a, a financial ledger and all that. And what sort of responsibilities do you have with that? Like what happens if something that ledger disappears or, or whatever? Yeah, under a non-disclosure agreement, I think you have an obligation for the safekeeping of any information uh, or any materials embodying that information that's covered by the agreement. So, yeah, if your client provides you with materials, I think you need to keep them, you know, uh, reasonably under lock and key. I mean, you can't protect against everything and, and maybe you don't have a big safe to put your <laughs> your client's stuff in. Uh, but, you know, a locked filing cabinet, something like that is not a bad approach. If you're keeping stuff on a computer, should you know, you have to wonder, should you be encrypting your drives, things like that, uh, and password protection for sure. Um, because yeah, if it is, if it does get out there and it was your fault, even if it was because of a burglary or a hacker or something like that, they could look to you and, and say that you're liable. So uh, I think you need to take sensible business-like precautions with this information. That's good information. Looking back at the episode I recorded, I listened to it again before, uh, interviewing you, Gordon, and, uh, doing a little bit of research before sitting down here. One of the things that I noticed in uh, various places was that phone conversations are kind of in a, a limbo. Uh, a lot of places said that if it's not in writing that you should be, uh, that something falls under an NDA, that you should ask. Like if you have a discussion with a client over the phone and something isn't clear, you should have them email you something stating that that conversation was, falls under the NDA. What's a lawyer's perspective on that? You know, if the non-disclosure agreement is very broad and it says all communications are covered, then I would say a one-on-one a, a -on -one interpersonal conversation, a telephone, a Zoom call, whatever, would count just as the emails would and anything else. Now, the fact that particular piece of information was transmitted is hard to prove when it was an oral communication. So, yeah, getting something sent in, in an email, of course, documents it for both sides to understand, okay, this is now covered by this confidential information. You know, the fact of it is you might have learned about, you know, what those 11 ingredients in the spice recipe of, uh, you know, whatever are through your own research and not because someone at, at uh, the company revealed it to you. And so, you know, they're going to be concerned that you would have that, you know, so I guess the, the answer is an, uh, an oral communication, a telephonic communication can be covered. It's just a lot harder to prove because there's no, you know, physical evidence to show it. Now, I, I do want to say that there's another component of this that people should just be aware of, and it's not really on the subject of our conversation, but it deals with the privacy laws relating to telephone conversations and recording them. It is not okay in most instances to record a telephone conversation, even if it's just for your own archival records purposes, unless the, the parties on both sides of the call consent to that. Now, that varies from state to state. Some places say, only one party has to know it's being recorded. And most places say everybody on the call needs to know it's being recorded. So just be aware of that. Yeah, I know with my podcast branding business, I always do a video chat on Zoom with all my clients. And I make sure in the email when I set it up, I let them know that this will be recorded for my purposes. Uh, and they have to approve to the recording before I will get on with them. And there's a little red light that's blinking saying we're recording. True, <laughs> true. So. One thing that we didn't really touch on, but I just want to bring it out in case some of my listeners are, are this, the whole NDA non-disclosure agreement thing is new to them, is that an NDA doesn't just cover information that you share, but it also prevents you from using any of that information for your own benefit. Right. There's a lot of uh, overlap here between copyright and patent and trademark law and, and the non-disclosures, because when you are hired to create work for someone else, uh, most of the time that's done under a work made for hire kind of an understanding. Either the agreement specifically says it's work for hire or it is the result of, you know, the, the legal structure of things or you're, you're transferring ownership. And that means that, yeah, once you've transferred ownership, once it belongs to somebody else, you don't get to use it without their consent and authorization. So 
again, it goes back to that question of, you know, if you want to use something in your portfolio, make sure you have the right to do so in the written agreement because you may not actually own it. Yeah. Or it could go as far as like if you're building a website for somebody, like say a membership site, you might have access to all their members and you could say, oh, look, these are all potential clients. I could email all these people to see if they need design work. The most common examples of the kind of stuff that's covered under non-disclosures and, and really we're talking about what are called trade secrets, things like customer lists, vendor lists, pricing calculations, all those kinds of things. Those have tremendous value to the company that has them. and. Uh, that value gets undermined as soon as everybody else has access to it as well. So really, though, yeah, exactly. Those are the kinds of things. But, it, you know, so it might be the the customer list or the vendors or something like that. It might just be, um, you know, what plugins are used on a particular website to make it operate in a certain way. Uh, somebody clever came up with a, a particular approach. And while it's not patentable or copyrightable, that particular approach could be valuable because it's secret. So, yeah, you really have to watch it. Now, is there ever a situation where, as the designer working for a client, we might want to initiate the NDA as opposed to a client coming to us with one? Well, sure. If you are providing uh, either, uh, you know, again, a particular approach, style, methodology, those kinds of things in, in the design process, you might not want the client to use those until you've been fully get hired, you know, let's say you're bidding on a job or something like that, and you're providing some sample designs or something like that, you may want to say, hey, these are confidential, and I agree, you agree not to use them until and unless you actually hire me for the job. So you come up with a particular color scheme and, and uh, you know, overall look and feel uh, a lookbook for a product line or something like that. You don't want them using that unless they hire you to do the work, right? That's true. So yeah, you might want to do an NDA in the bid process. We've been talking a lot about NDAs, but what about a non-compete? Is that similar to an NDA or how does that work? They come up together often. You know, a company will ask you to hold all this information confidential. And by the way, sometimes it's a separate agreement. Sometimes it's a, you know, paragraphs in the master agreement as well, promising not to compete with the company's business or sometimes not to work for their competitors for a period of time. I would say be really careful about this and reluctant. I mean, you don't want to limit your op opportunity to work in a particular market segment merely because you've done design work for one particular brand that shouldn't stop you from taking work from other brands that, you know, see the quality of your work and think, hey, we got to get this guy. So in some places, non-compete agreements are actually considered illegal. Uh, here in California, the courts just will not enforce a non-compete. You can't hire somebody and say you can't work for anybody else for two years after this. Other places, it's a little more flexible. And, you know, the, the length of time and the geographic scope or market scope of the of the restriction will determine whether or not it's reasonable. So uh, I would be cautious and reluctant about signing one at all. But if the job is good enough, you, you do what you have to do. Uh, my listeners know I've, I've shared the story many times on the podcast before. I, I do work for two competing golf clubs in my area. And when I was hired by the second golf club, they actually wanted me to sign uh, a non-compete agreement. Mm -hmm. And I refused knowing and not telling them that I already had the other golf club or golf course as one of my clients. And they, they don't know, uh, unless they listen to the podcast, they don't know that I, I also do work for their competition. It's never prevented me from doing good work for either of them, but I refused. And, and they were fine with that because... Uh, they had worded it a little too broadly and not just certain one. They just didn't want me to work for any other golf course. And I said, no, I won't agree to that. Yeah. I mean, it's a tricky situation. It can be, it can be a political thing too. Even if they don't have the, the actual non-compete language in the agreement, if you had m multiple competitors on your client roster and one of, and you didn't tell them all, or they, you know, you were keeping it a secret and one of them found out, they might say, well, that's it. We're going to find someone. You, you lose the job for the future. And so there's something to be said for the transparency about it. And sometimes just having that conversation, here's why I won't sign it, <laughs> is enough to say, oh, okay, we get it. As long as we're not seeing the same design, you know, crossing everybody's campaigns, yeah. we're fine. But, you know, and that's about ethics and morals as much as anything. Yeah, good. So I had a list of questions and I think we covered just about everything here. Is there anything else, Gordon, that you can think of that we haven't covered as far as NDAs go? You know, Mark, I think we've done a pretty good job of covering non-disclosure agreements, confidentiality, and, and the related topics. My, one thing I will say, though, is anytime you're presented with a, a contract with language that you 
um, that you read and you sort of scratch your head and you're wondering, it's really a good idea to talk to a lawyer, talk to somebody or, or, or someone with, with experience in these things, ask the questions and raise the issues. And sometimes it's, it's enough just to open the conversation with the client or whoever's presenting that document saying, now, what is this really supposed to mean? And I'm not sure I can live with it. You know, what can we do? And have a, have a negotiation over things. Good, good. Well, thank you very much for your time, Gordon. I'm sure this is going to be very valuable to people. As I said, the other issue I did, which was just me talking with what I knew, was very popular. So I'm sure this is going to be just as popular as that episode. I'm going to make sure to connect the two so anybody finds the other one will know about this one and vice versa. But before we sign off, is there any sort of credentials or anything you want to share with anybody? Let them know in case they want to get a hold of you. Well, the name is Firemark. That's F-I-R-E-M-A-R-K. And you can find me on most social media. G Firemark is the handle. I do a lot of Facebook Live and talking about legal issues, mostly in the podcasting space, but also in, in other entertainment and media related stuff. So follow me on Facebook and um, you can always find out more about me and my products at GordonFiremark.com. Well, thank you very much for being on the show, Gordon. Mark, thanks so much for having me. It's been fun. So there you have it. That was non-disclosure agreements. Hopefully this will help you to understand them better so that you'll know what to expect the next time a client asks you to sign one. Now, before I go, I just want to remind you one more time about the resourceful designer community. All I'll say is the members in there would love to have you as part of the community. To learn more, visit resourcefuldesigner.com slash community and join today. So that's it for me. I'd love to know what you thought of this break in format of having a guest on the show. Send me an email, feedback at resourcefuldesigner.com and let me know. But until next time, I am Mark Decote, wishing you all the best with your design business and reminding you to stay creative. Thanks for listening to the Resourceful Designer Podcast at resourcefuldesigner.com.